Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, as I mentioned in my announcements, I had a wonderful time at the Higher Things Youth Conference last week. For me, it was like one of those proverbial mountaintop experiences. To worship with 600 other Christians, many of whom were young people, was simply exhilarating. I think it was a little bit like heaven on earth as I received a foretaste of the bliss and joy that will be ours when the Lord gathers us around his eternal throne to worship him with all the saints and angels forever. Although I was pretty tired by the last day of the conference, there was a part of me that didn't want the conference to end. When the closing service was over, I was a bit sad, knowing we had to go home. And so I can't wait until next year when I hope perhaps I'll get to spend a few more days on top of that mountain once again. Well, in today's Gospel reading, we hear about John the Baptist. And I imagine that John had his share of mountaintop experiences. One of those was when he began his ministry at the Jordan River. At the beginning of his Gospel, St. Mark writes, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Talk about a mountaintop experience. Hundreds, if not thousands of people, were coming out to him for baptism. Imagine if that were to happen here at Grace. If one Sunday, hundreds of people from our community came to hear the word of God and be baptized, we would be thrilled and overjoyed, and I can only think that John felt the same way too. But you know, there was even more for John in store on top of that mountain. For you see, one day a very special visitor came to John, Jesus himself. And not only that, But when Jesus was baptized by John, John heard and saw the Holy Trinity. As Jesus, the Son of God, stood in the water, the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove, while the Father spoke from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Speaking, of course, about Jesus. John heard the very voice of the Father in heaven as he baptized Jesus. And so this wasn't just a mountaintop experience. This was like being in heaven itself. In that moment, I think, I imagine that John must have just wished that he could stay there and soak it all in. But of course he couldn't. Just as we couldn't stay at the Higher Things Conference last week. None of us can stay on top of the mountain while we sojourn here on earth. Much of our life instead is lived in the valley, in those dark and difficult times. And this was especially true for John. In fact, the next time we read about John in Mark's Gospel is in today's reading when we learn about his arrest and execution at the hands of Herod. John went from being in the presence of the Holy Trinity at the Jordan River to now sitting bound in a jail cell. Why? What had happened to him? Well, as we heard in today's reading, John was arrested and executed because he was faithful to the word of God especially God's word about marriage. John had told Herod that it was unlawful for him to marry his brother's ex-wife, Herodias. And not only that, but Herod and Herodias had both divorced their previous spouse so that they could marry each other. This was not only unlawful, this was adultery in God's eyes. 
Jesus teaches in Mark chapter 10, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her, and if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And so, as God's prophet and spokesman, John confronted Herod and Herodias with their sin, with their adultery as he had done at the Jordan River when he called the people of Israel to repent of their sins. So now he called on Herod and Herodias to acknowledge their transgressions so that they might receive God's forgiveness for them. As we heard, Herod was willing to listen to John, although he was greatly perplexed by what John had told him. But not Herodias. She couldn't stand him. She wanted to shut him up, literally. And so, with her daughter's help, she found a way to do exactly that, to shut him up forever, to have him executed. Herod knew it was wrong, but he went along with her plan anyway. He had John beheaded and placed his severed head on a platter for all to see. Oh, how the earthly fortunes of John so quickly changed in such a short period of time. One day, John was on top of the mountain as the people of Israel came to hear God's word and be baptized by him for the forgiveness of their sins. And the next, he was arrested and executed for proclaiming that same word of God to Herod and Herodias. John's mission and ministry had remained exactly the same but the reaction to it this time was completely different. My friends, the mission and ministry of God's church is the same today as it was for John. We also are to proclaim and teach God's word in all of its truth and purity, both to those who want to hear it and to those who don't. Like John, we are to call people to repent of their sins and turn instead in faith to Jesus, the one who is, as John declared, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now as we do this, we will have our share of mountaintop experiences as John did. Our worship service today is one of those. We gather each week with other Christians in the presence of Jesus to receive his gifts of forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation that he won for us on the cross. We receive a foretaste of heaven here as we are joined by the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven to sing our praises to Jesus, the crucified and risen Lord and Savior. And make no mistakes, my friends, we need to be here today on top of the mountain. We need church. We need Jesus. For with all the busyness and distractions of life, it's tempting to miss church or to underestimate its importance. But this is dangerous and is a trap of the devil. For the devil wants nothing more than to cut you off from God so that you would spend eternity apart from God forever. The devil hates church because he knows that in the divine service, God comes to you to feed your souls and bless you with the forgiveness of your sins. The gift of forgiveness that Jesus won for you on the cross, he now gives and distributes to you through the preaching of his word and through the eating and drinking of his body and blood in Holy Communion. Martin Luther says it well in one of his hymns. You shall observe the worship day that peace may fill your home and pray and put aside the work you do so that God may work in you. My friends, we need God's work in our lives because we know from hard experience that much of the other six days of the week are lived not on the mountain, but in the valley. The valley of the shadow of death, to be precise. 
unless Jesus returns first, we will all end up in the grave as John the Baptist did. And so the question for us becomes, where will you spend eternity after death? In heaven or hell? For the Christian, the answer is heaven. Although you deserve hell because of your sins, as I do, in his great mercy, God has prepared a place for you in heaven because of Jesus, who died and rose again to save you from your sins. Listen to these words of St. Paul from today's epistle reading. I want to read all of it. It is so wonderful in talking about all that the Lord has done for us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him... Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance, Paul goes on to say, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Simply put, heaven is your inheritance because of Jesus, Scripture says. You have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of your trespasses. What's more, you were sealed in your baptism with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of your inheritance until you acquire possession of it. The Holy Spirit now dwells in you, having made your body his temple. And so God is with you, not only during those great mountaintop moments in life, but he's also with you most especially during those terrible days in the valley and every day in between. And he'll always be with you until you reach your heavenly home with Jesus. Yes, heaven is ours, my friends, because of Jesus. But we're not there yet. And so until we reach that glorious day, the Holy Spirit sends us out to do what John the Baptist and countless other Christians have done before us. We are to faithfully proclaim God's word, both to those who want to hear it and to those who don't. We speak to them about the whole counsel of God, including such issues as marriage, as John the Baptist did. We share with our friends and neighbors, for example, that God created marriage to be holy, and it is to be the lifelong union of one man and one woman. Now we know that many in our culture today no longer want to hear that message. They consider it to be offensive and bigoted. Some may even get upset at us for it. I hope none of us will lose our head for speaking the truth about marriage as John did. But we may lose some of our friends. We may lose a job. We may even one day face government fines and lawsuits as has happened recently to some of our fellow Christians. You may have heard in the news recently about two Supreme Court cases about this very issue. And I know that Grace went through a very difficult time some years ago as you sought to uphold the sanctity of marriage. These issues are difficult and they're often very personal. But as God's people, we are called to speak the truth. But to speak the truth in love. The truth about marriage 
and most especially the truth about Jesus, the one who is the bridegroom who gave his life for his bride, the church. We joyfully share the good news that Jesus forgives all who repent of their sins, including those sins involving marriage. Yes, these are difficult issues and difficult times. And at times, it seems as if we're walking through a dark valley with no end in sight. But there is an end. There is light at the end of the tunnel. And my friends, that light is Jesus, the one who is the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Jesus will never forsake his bride, the church. And so, my friends, he will never forsake you. Jesus will lead and guide you until he brings you to the top of that greatest mountain, heaven itself, where you will celebrate with him and all his people at that marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no...